Welcome to SnoozeCast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on SnoozeCast.com and follow us on Instagram at SnoozeCast to find behind-the-scenes content. If you enjoy our show, please write a review on the Apple Podcasts app. Also, share us with a friend. If you'd like to get an email once a week with upcoming sleep stories and other news, subscribe to the Snoozeletter at snoozecast.com. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and by the Lord of Castle Yonder. Tonight, we'll read a section from the King Arthur series written by Maud Radford Warren titled Sir Gareth and Lynette. If you'd like to listen to the first stories in this series, you can find our episode titled The Sword Excalibur that aired on April 10th, 2020. If you'd like to listen to the whole series easily in order, go to snoozecast.com slash series. King Arthur was a legendary British leader who, according to medieval histories and romances, led the defense of Britain against Saxon invaders in the late 5th and early 6th centuries. If you'd like to listen to the first stories in this series, you can find our episode titled The Sword Excalibur that aired on April 10th, 2020. If you'd like to listen to the whole series easily in order, go to snoozecast.com slash series. King Arthur was a legendary British leader who, according to medieval histories and romances, led the defense of Britain against Saxon invaders in the late 5th and early 6th centuries. In the last episode, King Arthur decides he wants to marry Princess Guinevere and sends some of his men to ask her father, King Leodegran. This leads Leodegrand to investigate King Arthur's parentage to find out if he is truly from royal blood. Leodegrand seeks the counsel of Queen Bellicent, who has a young son named Gareth. Gareth pleads with her to be allowed to join his older brothers in joining the court of King Arthur. She finally concedes, as long as he disguises himself as a lowly kitchen worker first. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Gareth served in the kitchen of the king only one month, for his mother became sorry for the promise she had asked of him and sent armor for him to Arthur's court with a letter to the king telling who the youth was. With great joy, Gareth then went to Arthur and said, My lord, I can fight as well as my brother Gawain. At home we have proved it. Then make me a knight in secret, for I do not want the other knights to know my name. Make me a knight and give me permission to right the first wrong that we hear of. The king said gravely, You know all that my knights must promise? 
Yes, my lord, Arthur, I am willing to promise all. I will make you my knight in secret, since you wished it, Arthur said, except that I must tell Sir Lancelot. He is my dearest knight, and I keep no secrets from him. Gareth said that he would be glad to have Sir Lancelot know. Accordingly, the king spoke to Sir Lancelot about Gareth. I have promised him that he may right the first wrong we hear of, said Arthur. But as he has not yet proved what he can do, I want you to take a horse and follow him when he sets forth. Cover up the great lions on your shield so that he will not know who you are. Sir Lancelot agreed. Then Gareth was secretly made a knight. That same day, a beautiful young damsel came into Arthur's hall. She had cheeks as pink as apple blossoms and very sharp eyes. Who are you, damsel? asked the king. And what do you need? My name is Lynette, she said, and I am of noble blood. I need a knight to fight for my sister, Lenoris, a lady also noble, rich, and most beautiful. Why must she have a knight? questioned Arthur. My lord king, she lives in Castle Perilous. Around this castle, a river circles three times, and there are three passing places one over each circle of the river. Three knights, who are brothers, keep a constant guard over these passing places. A fourth knight, also a brother, clad in black armor, stands guard in front of my sister's castle. We have never seen this knight's face or heard his voice, but his brothers tell us he is the most powerful and daring knight in the world. All these four keep my sister a prisoner. And why? Because they want her to marry one of them so that they can have her great wealth. She refuses, but they say that they will have their way. In the meantime, they demand that you send Sir Lancelot to fight with them. They hope to overthrow Sir Lancelot, thus proving themselves the greatest warriors in the land. But I believe that Sir Lancelot could overthrow them. Therefore, I have come for him. Arthur remembered his promise to Sir Gareth and did not speak of Sir Lancelot, but asked, Tell me what these four knights, your enemies, are like. The three I have talked to are vain and foolish knights, my lord, answered the damsel. They have no law, and they acknowledge no king, yet they are very strong, and therefore am I come for Sir Lancelot. Then Sir Gareth rose up, crying, Sir King, give me this adventure. At this, Sir Kay started up in anger, but Gareth continued, My king, you know that I am but your kitchen boy, yet I have grown so strong on your meat and drink that I can overthrow a hundred such knights. The king looked at him a moment and said, Go then. At this, all the knights were amazed. The damsel's face flushed with anger. Shame, king, she cried. I asked you for your chief knight, and you give me a kitchen boy. 
then, before anyone could prevent, she ran from the hall, mounted her horse, and rode out of the city gate. Gareth followed, and at the doorway found a noble war horse, which the king had ordered to be given him. Nearby were the two faithful servants who had followed him from his mother's home. They held his armor. Gareth put it on, seized his lance and shield, jumped upon his horse, and rode off joyfully. Sir Kay, who was watching, said to Sir Lancelot, Why does the king send my kitchen lad to fight? I'll go after the boy and put him into pots and pans again. Sir Kay, do not attempt to do that, said Sir Lancelot. Remember that the king commanded him to go. But Sir Kay leapt on his horse and followed Gareth. Meanwhile, Sir Gareth overtook the damsel and said, Lady, I am to right your wrong. Lead and I follow. But she cried, Go back. I smell kitchen grace when you're near. Go back. Your master has come for you. Gareth looked behind and saw that Sir Kay was riding up to him. When Sir Kay was within hearing distance, he shouted, Come back with me to the kitchen. I will not, said Gareth. Then Sir Kay rode fiercely at the youth. Gareth, however, struck him from his horse and then turned to the damsel, saying, Lead on. I follow. She rode for a long time in silence, with Gareth a few paces behind her. At last she stopped and said, You have overthrown your master, you kitchen boy, but I don't like you any better for it. I still smell the kitchen grease. Sir Gareth said, very gently, You may speak to me as you will, but I shall not leave you till I have righted your wrong. Ha, huh, she said scornfully, You talk like a noble knight, but you're not one. And she again galloped in front of him. Presently, as they passed a thick wood, a man broke out of it and spoke to them. Help, help, they're drowning my lord. Follow, I lead, shouted Gareth to the damsel and rushed into the wood. There he found six men trying to drown a seventh. Gareth attacked them with such vigor that they fled. When the rescued man had recovered, he thanked Gareth warmly. I'm the lord of the castle yonder, he said, and these are my enemies. You came in time. Then he begged Gareth and the lady to stay all night in his castle. They agreed, and he led the way. He took them into his large hall and was about to seat them side by side at a dining table. But the damsel said in scorn, This is a kitchen boy, and I'll not sit by him. The lord looked surprised. He took Gareth to another table and sat beside him. After they had eaten, he said, you may be a kitchen boy, or the damsel may be out of her mind, but 
whichever is the case, you're a good fighter, and you saved my life. The next morning, Gareth and the damsel set forth. They rode for a while in silence, and then she said, Sir Kitchen Boy, although you are so low, I would like to save your life. Soon we are coming to one who will overthrow you, so turn back. But Gareth refused. In a little while, they came to the first circle of the river. The passing place was spanned by a bridge. On the farther side of the bridge was a beautiful pavilion draped in silk of gold and crimson colors. In front of it passed a warrior without armor. Damsel, he cried, is this the knight you have brought from Arthur's court to fight with me? Ah, she said, the king scorns you so much that he has sent a kitchen boy to fight with you. Take care that he does not fall on you before you're armed, for he is a knave. The warrior went inside his tent for his armor, and the damsel said to Gareth, Are you afraid? Damsel, he said, I am not afraid. I would rather fight twenty times than hear you speak so unkindly of me. Yet your cruel words have put strength into my arm. I shall fight well. Then the knight came forth all in armor, and he said, Youth, you're a kitchen boy. Go back to your king. You're not fit to fight with me. Gareth rode at him fiercely, saying, I am of nobler blood than you. He fought so well that soon his enemy was overcome. Then Gareth said, Go to Arthur's court and say that his kitchen boy sent you. When the knight had departed, Gareth rode on with the damsel in advance. After a little while, she stopped her horse, and when he had caught up with her, she said, Youth, I do not smell the kitchen grace so much as I did. Then she galloped off, laughing over her shoulder, while Gareth followed her a little more slowly. When they reached a second circle of the river, the damsel said, Here is the brother of the knight you overthrew. He is stronger than the first. You had better go home, kitchen boy. Gareth answered nothing. Out of the tent by the bridge, which crossed the second circle of water, came a knight clad in armor, which glowed like the sun. Lynette shouted to him, I bring a kitchen boy who has overthrown your brother. Ah, shouted the knight, and he rode fiercely at Sir Gareth. The two fought for a long time, the warrior was strong, but Sir Gareth was stronger, and at last overthrew him and sent him back to Arthur's court. The damsel Lynette had ridden far ahead of him. When he came near her, she said, the knight's horse slipped, and that's why you overcame him. And now, are you ready to fight with the third knight? 
for there he stands. At the third and most inner circle of the river stood the third knight, clad not in armor, but in hardened skins. Sir Gareth saw that he was more powerful than his brothers. The two at once began to fight on the bridge, but Sir Gareth's sword could not pierce the hard skins. Again and again he tried and failed. He grew tired and began to fear that he should be conquered. But all at once, when his strokes were becoming feeble, Lynette cried out to him, Well done, good knight. You are no kitchen boy, but a brave lord. Strike for me. Do not lose. You are worthy to be a knight of the round table. When Sir Gareth heard this, he was so encouraged that he made a final great effort and threw his enemy over the bridge into the water. Then he turned to Lynette saying, Lead, I follow. But Lynette, proud now of her valiant escort, and humbled and ashamed at her misjudging of him, said, no, we shall ride side by side. I'm very sorry I called you a kitchen boy, for I know that you are a noble knight. They rode happily side by side till dusk when they came in sight of Castle Perilous. Just as they were about to cross the moat, a knight overtook them. It was Sir Lancelot, who had been delayed because he had stopped to help Sir Kay after Sir Gareth had thrown him from his horse. The great knight, as he rode up to the two in the twilight, seeing only the shields which Sir Gareth had taken from the three knights, thought the young man was an enemy and attacked him. Sir Lancelot was so strong that he soon overcame the youth. As he fell, Lynette cried out in shame and sorrow, and Sir Gareth said, Oh, I am thrown. Sir Lancelot knew Sir Gareth's voice and raised him up, saying, I am Lancelot, and I am sorry to have overthrown you, my friend. Sir Gareth said that it was no dishonor to be beaten by Sir Lancelot. Then the three rode into the castle there they met the fourth knight, who was all covered with black armor. Sir Lancelot wished to fight with him, but Sir Gareth would not permit it. This must be my adventure, he said. Sir Gareth rode at the knight, expecting to meet a very strong man, but he easily unhorsed him. His enemy cried, Oh, spare my life. I'm not a knight. Then he took off his helmet and showed the face of a young boy. My three brothers made me pretend to be a fierce knight, he explained. They thought it would make people more afraid if they believed we were four strong knights. Sir Lancelot and Sir Gareth laughed heartily, and so did Lynette, 
they took the boy into the castle where Lynette's sister, Leonoris, who was now freed from her money-loving captors, greeted them with much joy. She put before them a great feast, and this time Sir Gareth and Lynette sat side by side. Afterwards, a marriage was made between them, and they went to live with King Arthur in Camelot. Sir Ivan Among Arthur's knights of the round table was one who was a mixture of good and bad, as indeed most people are. His name was Sir Ivan, brave, kind-hearted, and merry, but at the same time fickle, sometimes forgetful of his promises, and inclined to make light of serious things. One night in the early spring, the knights and ladies of Arthur's court were sitting in the dining hall. The king and Guinevere had withdrawn, but were expected to return. Supper had been served, and the last course, consisting of pomegranate seeds and dates, had just been carried off. A fire had been built in the deep hearth, and the four bronze pillars in front were lighted by the flames. Four little pages in blue and white velvet kirtles sat on stools watching the fire, and perhaps dreaming of the days when they too should be warriors and have adventures. Sir Ivan was telling of his experience with the Black Knight. It was when I was very young, he said. Indeed, I had just been made a knight. Someone told me of the wicked Black Knight who lived and still lives in a wood a long way from here. Knowing that he did much evil, I determined to kill him. I rode to the wood where he lived, and in which I found a marble platform. In the middle of it was a sunken space holding a fountain. I walked to this, and, following the directions of some writing which was on the stone, picked up a cup that lay at hand, and filling it with water, poured it into the fountain. Then a great storm of wind and rain arose, and when it was at its height, the black knight rode up and began to attack. We fought for a little while, but he easily overthrew me, thinking me done for. He rode back, leaving me on the ground. But after a time, I was able to mount my horse and went back to my mother's castle. At this moment, the king and queen entered, unperceived by anyone except Sir Ivan. The young man, who was always polite, sprang to his feet. Then the other knights rose. Sir Kay who was not always sweet-tempered, said to Sir Ivan, We all know that you're very polite, but you have more courtesy than bravery. At that, Sir Ivan said, I was almost a boy when the Black Knight overthrew me, but I could conquer him now. It's very easy for you to say that after you've eaten, said Sir Kay. Almost any knight feels brave and self-satisfied when he has a good supper of venison. The king talked and asked what the conversation was about, 
Sir Ivan repeated the story of his adventure, adding, And Sir King, I crave your permission to set forth tomorrow to slay this black knight, who is a pest on the land. I have heard of this man, said the king, and have often thought of sending someone to punish him. But he lives far away. It has been necessary heretofore to right first the wrongs nearest home. Yet now his evil deeds and persecutions must cease. Tomorrow a company of us will set forth and conquer him and all his people. The king named some half-dozen of his knights, Sir Ivan among them, who were to undertake this adventure. Sir Ivan was displeased. He thought that the adventure should be his alone. So he rose in the middle of the night and stole away unattended, determined to go in advance of the others for the black knight did not occur to him that in proving himself brave, he was also proving himself disobedient. He rode forth in the darkness, humming merrily to himself. At daybreak, he reached a valley, and as he went through it, saw a great serpent fighting with a lion Sir Ivan stopped to watch this curious combat. At first, the two fighters seemed evenly matched, but soon the huge serpent wrapped all its folds about the lion, began squeezing it tightly. When Sir Ivan saw this, he drew his sword and killed the serpent. When the lion was free, bounded up to Sir Ivan, and he was afraid that it meant to kill him, but it fawned at his feet like a dog. He stroked it and put his arms about its neck. When he mounted his horse, the beast followed him, refusing to go away. Then Sir Ivan made up his mind that they were to be companions. For many days the two kept close together, and at night Sir Ivan would go to sleep with his head on the lion's neck. One day, as they came to a square castle set in a meadow, some people who stood on the castle walls began to shoot arrows at the lion, but Sir Ivan stopped them, telling them that the animal was tame. Then they told him that it was their rule that no one should pass by that castle without doing battle with their lord. Sir Ivan told them that he was quite willing to obey their rule, so they opened the castle gate. They said he must make his lion stay outside, but Sir Ivan refused to do this. He promised, however, to make the lion lie down quietly. Then the two were allowed to enter. The courtyard was a large, paved place in which there were a score of armed men. Presently, the lord of the castle came forward. This lord was much larger than Sir Ivan, and the lion, on seeing him, began to lash its tail. But Sir Ivan ordered it to be still, and it at once obeyed. Then, Sir Ivan and the knight battled together. The knight was powerful, but Sir Ivan was very agile and skillful. 
he was not able to strike so hard as could his enemy, but he was better able to avoid blows. Therefore, it was not long before he got the advantage and overthrew the Lord. When this happened, the Lord called for help and ordered his armed men to attack Sir Ivan. The whole twenty began to obey this treacherous order, but just as they were about to fall upon Sir Ivan, the lion bounded among them, roaring savagely. With a few strokes of its powerful paws, it disabled the men. Sir Ivan told the lord of the castle that he must ride to Camelot and give himself up to Arthur to be judged for his treachery. Then Sir Ivan rode away from the castle, and now that the lion had saved his life, he became very fond of the animal. After many days of travel, Sir Ivan reached the forest in the midst of which was the castle of the Black Knight. He rode to the platform of stone, dismounted, and poured water into the fountain. As before, a storm arose, and at its height, the Black Knight appeared. He recognized the armor of Sir Ivan and said, Ha ha, I see I did not kill you before, but you shall not escape me this time. The best man shall win, said Sir Ivan cheerfully. Then the two began a great combat. Their swords clashed, so that the noise of the fountain was drowned. They fought so eagerly that they were not even aware of the storm. It was not long before the Black Knight began to grow weak from the many powerful strokes from Sir Ivan's sword. At last, seeing that he was mortally wounded. The Black Knight turned his horse and galloped in the direction of his castle. Ordering the lion to stay where it had lain during the combat, Sir Ivan followed, but he could not quite catch up with the Black Knight although gaining on him inch by inch. By the time the castle moat was reached, Sir Ivan was only five feet behind. The horses thundered one after the other over the bridge. The Black Knight rode under the sharp iron gate, which was raised. The instant he was inside, it fell in order to shut out Sir Ivan. But Sir Ivan had already passed beneath it, and as it fell, his horse was injured. Even the long plume and Sir Ivan's helmet was shorn off and lay outside the gate. Sir Ivan sprang to his feet and drew his sword to renew his attack upon the Black Knight, but he was already dead and lay across his 
horse's neck. Then Sir Ivan realized what his recklessness had cost him. There he was, alone in a strange castle, the lord of which he had killed. Soon the people of the castle would come and capture him, for he could not escape since the gate was down. He ran into the castle and up the stairs leading to the turret. He was fast growing weak from the wounds he had received, and his armor was heavy. Moreover, in spite of his care, it clashed at every step. He was afraid someone would soon hear him. He had all but reached the top of the stairs when the door of the turret room opened and a maiden looked down upon him. He begged her not to cry out, and, telling her who he was and what he had done, asked her to hide him. I will, she said, because you are brave and you are wounded, and because you have killed that wicked tyrant, the Black Knight. He does not own this castle at all. It belongs to a beautiful lady, his cousin, who is my mistress. He keeps her here a prisoner because she will not marry him. Then the little maiden led him into the turret room. She concealed his armor in a hole in the side of the wall and told him to hide himself between the two mattresses of the bed. Before he had time to do so, however, they heard a great noise in the courtyard and, looking down, saw that the body of the Black Knight had been discovered. Near it stood a beautiful lady, more beautiful than any Sir Ivan had ever seen. She was dark like Queen Guinevere, and her eyes were as bright as stars. He would have gazed at her a long time, but the maiden begged him to hide without delay. Quick, she cried. The men have seen that there is the horse at the gate and know that the person who did this to our Lord must be here. Even now they have begun the search, for they all love the Black Knight although my mistress does not. So, Sir Ivan crept between the mattresses, and the little maiden hurried down the stairs and went to her beautiful mistress. Presently, Sir Ivan heard men tramping up the turret steps. They often stopped, trying all the doors they came to, and at last entered the room in which he lay. One of them, peering into the hole in the wall where his armor was, said, Here is armor, but another replied, that's just some that once was used by our master. There's no need to drag it into the light. Then 
They searched among all the furnishings of the room, but found none. At last, as they were leaving, they stopped and turned, but then left. When the men had gone, Sir Ivan crept out. Just then, the little maiden came in with food. When all of his wounds had been carefully attended to, using her robe as pieces of linen bandages, she gave him plentiful supper and promised to take care of him until there was a good opportunity for him to escape. She visited him every morning, told him the day's news in the castle, He learned that a lion kept roaring about the walls and that the bowmen had tried to kill it, but could not. Sir Ivan was sure that it was his lion and longed to have it, but knew that it was impossible. 